about two hundred years, one of the things that people often think about the whole question of uh, euthanasia or assisted dying, whether the term the young people or otherwise, is this very recent issue. Of course, it's been made very more prominent recently because of medical technology, which prolonging our lives, which we'll talk about, I guess, in a moment. But in fact, the legalisation of assisted dying for people uh, was first debated in Parliament in the 1930s. So for 80 years at least, it's been a, an ongoing conversation um, within medical and legal and political circles in Britain. And if you look back at some of those debates, it's quite interesting to see how social attitudes have changed in, in that time. Today, the most common objection to assisted dying, the legalisation of assisted dying, is that it would lead to you know, people feeling obliged to kill themselves, people rushing to death, people being bumped off. In the 1930s, the main argument made against it in Parliament was that legalisation was unnecessary because good doctors did it anyway. It was part of a, a good physician's arsenal against pain and suffering um, that one might end uh, a life uh, and that that would be the right thing to do. And the personal physician to George V, who was in the House of Lords at the time of the debate, uh, was one of the people who took that view. It was only subsequently, once he died and memoirs came to be written, that it was revealed that George V had been euthanised um, by his physician in order that the Times should have the exclusive of his death and not the evening papers, um, because he was going to die anyway. Um, and so they thought they might as well do it in a timely manner. The main case in favour, ethically and legally, that the British Humanist Association has made in favour of assisted dying rests on two main assumptions. One is that there may come a point in anyone's life when it is a reasonable and rational decision that a reasonable person might make to end one's own life. There may come a point um, when any one of us uh, may decide life just isn't worth living anymore. And that that is not something that is automatically to be argued against, to be rejected, because sometimes it may be rational and reasonable. Now there are some people who say, no, it's never right. It's never the right decision uh, to want to take your own life. They may say that because they think that life is, is, is in the gift of some other uh, force in the universe, uh, some god that doesn't want you to uh, end your own life, it's sort of spitting in the face of God if you make these decisions for yourselves, they may believe that. Um, or they may believe um, that there's always something better around the corner. This is often what people who believe very strongly in palliative care would say. They will say no matter what the suffering, no matter what it is, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how much you're suffering, you know, how miserable you feel, how tired of dependency you are, uh, how much pain you're in, it could always be relieved can always be made well enough to feel that life is worth carrying on. Um, so, you know, you don't have to believe in, in a God who's, who's, uh, to whom you owe your life uh, and from whom it is a gift to think that uh, suicide is, is never rational. You can be a sort of palliative care extremist um, and, and, and think that. A humanist position is different. It looks at people, it looks at people's real lives, recognises that people are individuals, that they're different from one another, that everyone has different thresholds and criteria for what makes life worthwhile, for what makes life worth living, and for what suffering is unendurable, for what suffering is endurable, and says, yes, in some circumstances, it could be reasonable, rational, and a choice to be respected to end one's life, to choose to end one's life. So that's the first sort of, I think, general premise on which uh, a humanist view rests. And the second premise is simple compassion. This operates in the case of people who are terminally ill, but also people who are not terminally ill, but are suffering for, for, for some other reason. And we'll perhaps talk more in a moment about the distinction, which is sometimes made by people, between assisted deaths for the terminally ill and assisted deaths for people who are not terminally ill, but are incurably suffering for in some other way, because some people make a distinction between those two, but I think it's actually quite difficult to make a moral distinction between uh, those two. Um, you may disagree with me, perhaps, 
discuss it. But let's come back to, to, to this idea of uh, compassion. Having accepted that it is a reasonable choice that some people might make uh, to end their lives, um, we're confronted with the reality uh, of the fact that uh, they may not have the means at their immediate disposal. Of course, anyone can kill themselves. It's easy to kill themselves. You can throw yourself in front of a chain. You can uh, drown yourself. You can slash your wrists. You can do all sorts of uh, things that uh, will lead to your uh, death. Often, they're, they're very violent. They're not the most peaceful ways uh, to die. Often, they will cause trauma to the people that you leave uh, behind you. Often, uh, they will present um, an insurmountable barrier of pain that you will not wish to cross even though you are ever so determined to end uh, your life. The compassionate response to someone who has made a reasonable decision, an autonomous reasonable decision to, to bring their own life to an end, um, I think the compassionate response is to provide them with the means to do so. With dignity, peacefully, uh, non-violently. And they're the basic, uh, they're the two basic uh, ethical propositions I think on which the whole case for assisted dying rests. The idea that it's a rational choice in some circumstances and the idea that we should have compassion for people in those circumstances and assist them. Now, in the case of, of terminally ill people, um, there, there, there are some people who seem to feel that because terminally ill people are going to die soon anyway, um, then it's more acceptable to help terminally ill people to die than it is to help other people who are suffering in some other way um, to die. And that's quite a, a prominent argument in the UK. The main organisation that argues for the legalisation of assisted dying in the UK called Dignity and Dying, uh, which used to be called the Voluntary Euthanasia Society, but recently changed its name um, to Dignity and Dying, they advocate only for legalisation of assisted dying for terminally ill people. Only for terminally ill people who have, they change their mind occasionally on what the threshold should be, but they say about six months to live. And there's a sort of feeling that it's difficult to pin down uh, quite what people mean by it, but there's a sort of feeling, uh, insubstantial feeling, that this is somehow okay. Whereas to give assistance in dying to someone like Tony Nicholson, whose case was recently in the headlines, is wrong. And the reason why it's okay in the case of a, a terminally ill person, but wrong in the case of Tony Nicholson, is that Tony Nicholson could live on and on and on and on and on. He's not in any imminent uh, danger of, of dying. So to just bring in his death closer uh, by a few months um, is not an option, and therefore it's the best ethical uh, thing to do. I think that's complete nonsense um, from, a, from a moral point of view, um, for all sorts of reasons, mainly <clears throat> for the reason I said at the beginning, that it is not for you, you to judge, not for any of us to judge, um, where the threshold for suffering uh, and you know, worthwhile life falls for any one person. It's for them to judge. We may want to assure ourselves that they are making a judgment free from coercion. We want to assure ourselves they're making a judgment based on the best, best possible evidence that they can have. Um, but at the end of the day, we're still going to want to say we respect your judgment, we respect your choice, we respect your freedom. So that's the main reason um, why I think that the, the distinction between terminal illness and incurable suffering is, is a false one. But another reason, I think, um, is around the argument of compassion. If you accept that one of the reasons for helping someone to end their life with dignity is compassion, then I don't see that it matters that, they're in fact, I think we're in the other way. Six months of suffering, as against 20 years of suffering, decade after decade of suffering, that someone like Tony Nicholson uh, with locked in syndrome could face. If anything, you want to be more compassionate towards um, uh, the longer period of suffering. But anyway, that, that question doesn't arise because I think, in fact, in practice, the case it should be indistinguishable. Tony Nicholson um, is the most recent case that we've been involved in, so perhaps I'll move at this point to talk about some individual cases. Tony Nicholson uh, was a victim of locked in syndrome. Um, after a sporting accident, um, he uh, found himself with this syndrome, which essentially meant he couldn't move uh, from the neck down. He could barely speak, he could communicate um, through uh, a sort of machine where he would tap out you know, the syllables that would be 
he spoke in his words. Um, he wanted to end his life. Um, medical technology was keeping him alive. This is one of the genuine reasons why the debate is more heated now, because medical technology has brought us to a point where it can keep us all alive for really a very, very, very long time, um, far beyond the point when our life had any quality um, to us. Um, but medical technology was keeping him alive, and he wanted the same medical technology that was keeping him alive to step in, to intervene, to end his life with dignity. He could theoretically have ended his life whenever he wanted by refusing treatment, by disengaging from the, the various treatments that were essential to, to keeping him alive. But he knew that it would be uh, painful, he knew that it would cause suffering, he knew that it would be painful not just for him but for his family and those around him, his wife who was caring for him, his daughters who were, who were, who were caring for him. And so he wanted um, a more graceful exit than that. Um, peace of mind for his family, uh, and, a, and a dignified end for himself. <coughs> now he went to the High Court, we supported him, um, intervened on his behalf, and we're taking his case now to the Supreme Court, which will rule on the, on the, on the leading points uh, this year. Um, in the interim though, having been, having uh, had the ruling go against him in the High Court, he did actually in the end uh, die uh, by not accepting treatment for pneumonia when he uh, contracted it. Paul Lamb is Another case, currently before the Supreme Court, it got bundled in together with the Tony Nicholson case for the convenience of the judges, this often happens. If the same legal point is there to be decided, they'll fold a number of cases together to decide them all at once. Paul Lamb is still alive. Um, he had an accident, had the same locked in syndrome, he could slightly move one finger, that would soon uh, come to an end, he will not be able to move that finger um, anymore. Um, he wants uh, the same medical assistance that Tony Nicholson was seeking, exactly the same reasons. Um, he's got people around him that he loves and love him, he doesn't want to suffer it. his own drawn out agony, nor does he want to suffer it uh, himself. He's an incredible man, I mean, he came to court uh, every day in the hearings of when they were at the High Court, in spite of being in incredible pain. Um, and he's still alive waiting for that judgment. I do meet in the course of my work people in his situation. One of the things that annoys me more than anything else is when people who are opposed to assisted dying for their own ideological reasons, very often, whether they're religious or otherwise, most of the opposition is based on unshared religious uh, beliefs um, that are deployed in the public sphere in an illiberal way. Um, they, it really annoys me when people talk about um, vulnerable people as if. Um, any legalisation of assisted dying um, will lead to vulnerable people being targeted somehow for murder, you know, for involuntary euthanasia, for, for, for you know, being assisted when they don't really want it. Firstly, because when you look at people like Paul or Tony, um, they are the very opposite of vulnerable. They are determined people with settled wishes, brave people, very brave people, courageous, um, with incredible families often supporting them. They're tirelessly campaigning in spite of all the suffering they're going through themselves to change the law for others, because they often know that the legal change will never help them for others. Selfless, brave, courageous people, you the opposite of them. And also because the assumption behind this idea that vulnerable, vulnerable people will um, uh, be bumped off in, 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 you know, in a post-legalisation world is seldom borne out by the reality of what you see of people's families. The assumption behind the idea that people bumped off is that you know their families will be hurrying them along into the in, into the grave. Almost universally, the opposite is true. It's a very hard thing for a partner, a lover, a wife, a husband, or a child, or, or a parent, or anything. A very hard thing for them to give in to your wishes to end your life. They're the people usually who say no, don't do it. <laughs> you know, don't leave me, don't go. I can care for you. I can, you know. I can, I can look after you, why are you doing this? And sometimes, of course, that's about the person. It can be sort of, why are you doing this to me? You know, why are you leaving me? Um, but just as often, it's selfless. Um, it's, you know, I want you to carry on. Now, of course, uh, you know, uh, there are always uh, cases of the opposite and people who do bad things. Um, but to assume in a blanket way um, that, you know, human nature is such that if 
the sister dying is legalised, we'll all be bumping off our grannies and mums to, to, to get the insurance money. It's, it's, it's quite disgusting. Now, where was I before I got this disgusting like that uh, <laughs> <laughs> argument? Uh, I thought I'd read you a couple of the case studies um, from people who've had these experiences. I'll leave these with you if they're useful as a stimulus for your own uh, uh, work. Um, because one of the things that they show um, is the real situations, the real life situations that the current legal uh, barriers create. People die sooner than they have to. That's one of the ironies of, of the current ban on assisted dying. Um, people who want to die in, in Switzerland have to, have to be fit enough to travel there. So they travel there when they're still relatively fit and healthy. Um, and so they die years, maybe years earlier than they would want to in ideal circumstances. Um, an irony, considering that uh, a lot of the opposition to assisted dying legalisation is people who want to live longer. Um, but also, uh, as well as uh, people dying earlier than they might otherwise wish to, they often die in secret, without the love and support of the people with them that they would want, often because they fear prosecution for their uh, friends or lovers or family or anything. As close to them, or because they are worried that their, their end may be painful and drawn out and don't want their uh, closest people to witness that. One of the uh, case studies that I don't think I have uh, brought with me actually, but it's extreme, I may have only mentioned it's extremely hard um, is one where from a young man who sent uh, his partner off for a weekend in London with uh, his mother um, uh, and it was sort of meant to be a surprise for them so they could spend some time together at, at the theatre and when they came back he ended his own life um, with the only drugs that he could find online which took about 36 hours or so to act um, and um, he made all the arrangements uh, to die alone. Um, part of his talked out of it, I assume, um, but also because he didn't want uh, the people that he loved. He did love his mother in law, uh, as against the rules of some things. Um, and uh, also his, his boyfriend to, to not have to be with him at that point. When I reach that stage, I'm prepared to use the well tried method of polythene bag and sleeping pills. But if I suffer a stroke, as I may again, I will need help. My mother was dying of lung cancer at a small hospital, but her sister, a retired GP, managed to persuade the authorities to allow her sister to come to her home nearby. I expect the hospital and their doctors knew the purpose. My mother died soon after with her sister's help, with barbiturates. But most people do not have a brother or sister qualified and able to provide that relief. My partner ended his life last March and had motor neuron disease. He would have preferred to have lived longer and chose an assisted suicide further down the road. Sadly, this was not an opportunity available to him. We looked at Dignitas, that's the clinic in Switzerland, but can that We looked at Dignitas, but he didn't want to die in that strange environment, so he committed suicide while he was still physically able. He was weeks, if not days, away from being unable to feed himself. I helped him to the lavatory and did everything for him, but feeding himself was important because he knew it meant he could still administer a fatal dose orally himself, which is what he did. He was 35 when he died. And he always said to me that the greatest burden was knowing he had to end his own life. If assisted suicide had been available, I have no doubt he would have waited longer. In 2004, my mother-in-law was diagnosed with mouth cancer. Over the next two years, I became her advocate and subsequently her carer. She died at home. Six months after her death, my husband was diagnosed with kidney cancer, and for a period of three or so years, I supported him and nursed him through his illness. He died in 2008, again at home. More recently, I provided this woman's out of a lot. <laughs> More recently, I provided support to my father during his terminal illness, and he died in a care home in 2011. My mother currently has dementia, and I advocated on her behalf under her living will, which she drafted some 12 years ago. These four unique perspectives on how people face death 
has given me full recognition of the desperate need for the law to accommodate individual wishes and not just the narrowly drawn views of a minority. I am absolutely clear in my mind that the possibility of assisted dying would have been of comfort and reassurance to my husband, his mother and my father. I don't know for certain that I could have assisted my husband to die had he felt able to ask. I'd like to think that I could have found the courage to do that for him. I think what comes across from all of these uh, case studies um, is that it's something that's borne out from regimes where assisted dying has been made legal. It's not that people all rush uh, to end their lives uh, straight away, but it's that people, in the knowledge that their own autonomy will be respected, in the knowledge that this is an option, in the knowledge that society as a whole is willing to treat this as a choice and to help people when it comes to it, if it comes to it, um, to end their own lives uh, with dignity and spirit of compassion. It's a sort of existential comfort to people, um, especially um, as uh, they find themselves in a, in a position of illness, mainly uh, dependent on, on people around them for the most uh, basic things. And I think that that existential comfort is something that flows out through society in the end when these big social changes happen. And I think this is the deep irony, really, um, in the debate. There are people who, from the religious side, but not all the opposition is religious, but let's just say people who oppose legalisation. There are people who oppose legalisation who paint a nightmare picture of the sort of society that we will become. Not just the things that will happen to individuals, but the sort of society that we will become if we allow this. And it's usually a nightmare vision of people dying before their time, then it's you know, mentally ill children being euthanised, and then it's disabled people being euthanised, and before you know it, we're in 1930s Germany, in the horrific imaginings of, of, of these people. But I think all the evidence and all reason would suggest that the opposite would be true. If we legalise assisted dying, what we're doing is saying we respect people. We respect people's individual wishes. We understand that freedom of choice is important, and that everyone is a different individual different priorities. We respect that. We respect the dignity of difference in that sense. And also we are compassionate. We know that people suffer. We recognise that medical advances have created amazing opportunities uh, for our increased health and increased longevity. But at the same time we recognise um, that the same spirit that motivates us to allow someone, to help someone who is suffering to live as full and active a life as possible because they want to. That same spirit of should motivate us to help someone who wants to end their life with as much dignity as possible in that same situation to help them. And it's from, if it's from that spirit of compassion and respect that we proceed to legalisation, then I think that the social change will be quite opposite from the nightmare one, will be a better society, a more compassionate society that values individuals more highly, um, not less, as, as the opponents of legalisation would have. And that's what I want to say, but I mean, I presumably there's this option for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone, yeah, anyone have the... We've been looking at this topic for quite some time now, I suppose, so it's all churning over and you're looking at it. Yeah. It's great for what I've said before. Um, we're looking into um, living well, and I just want to know, do you think that there's how much a doctor is respecting that if someone has a living well, how much they're respecting their wishes, how they are? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that there's much evidence, actually, um, either way. Um, I think, I mean, the living <coughs> world is a, a tremendously important instrument. Um, it's a recognition. Uh, its introduction is a recognition of, of, of some of what I was talking about, the fact you know, that, that, that medical technology has transformed um, uh, the end of life and brought so many of us to the point where we won't be able to express our own wishes you know, at that time. Um, I, I've never heard, well, I've never heard the case of a living will being disrespected. Um, and I think one would expect to hear. Um, however, it's also always going to be the case that, that living wills will have force when there are people to advocate for the person who left it. 
Um, and so one might not care if a piece is sort of, sort of uh, advanced directives being um, disrespected. Yeah. Dignity and Diamond may be built with fine information on this because they, their sister charity produces the books that live in the same time. Uh, I mean, advanced directives are, are a, a difficult legal territory. I think uh, I was reading that there's different stages of living will. There's a, a side of the living will where you can make um, specific decisions like mm. who would have uh, powers of attorney, yeah. and this has to be respected. But then there's other things, for instance, uh, you can decide if, um, let's say, you're in a coma and you don't want to be fed. Mm. Uh, you can decide this, but on this, the doctor um, can take into account this decision, but doesn't have to yeah. follow it. And I think also that the person to whom you've given power to me as well. I mean, I, I, okay. I don't think it's just the doctor. Oh, I, think, okay. I think you can, uh, I think the doctor could talk to that person. Oh yeah, can yeah. also yeah. decide what's best. say, no, or... actually, we don't yeah. want to expect that much. I mean, it's a bit, yeah, it, this tube is tagged a bit like organ donation. You know? There are all sorts of areas in which you're not quite, you know, where, where is consent, where is autonomy, where is choice. And I think that's an ethically difficult question as well. I mean, I may very well say now, yes, I don't want to be, um, you know, uh, revived if this same so thing happens. Um, but I may genuinely change my mind um, along, the, along the line, that's difficult. There's also think, the issue of uh, people uh, writing the living will, you know, when they're like 30 and then something happens to them when they're 60 and, exactly. you know. You're a different person. Yeah. Totally Do you still different. have to take into account? I think it's more promising to look at the work that's being done when uh, through brain scans and uh, the linguistic. Uh, you, you can sort of uh, look at a brain and know when someone is saying yes or no, even if they can't uh, speak. There's, 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 there's early evidence that that's the case. I mean, that, they have to be able to hear you obviously and <laughs> to, to, to have a response to the brain. I think that's actually a, a, a more promising test. This just makes occurring to me as you're talking. I remember not all that long ago working with the BMA a little bit, and the issue was that doctors, male doctors, um, on the whole, can't cope with tears, can't cope with watching somebody cry, and can't cry themselves. So there's a lot of suppression of how you feel when someone is trying to communicate something to you which kind of means you're not really listening. It means you're listening to the facts of the case, but you're not listening to something much deeper that's going on with people. And, you know, just that simple expression, let me go, when I hear anybody say, let me go, my immediate um, response to that is, uh, well, if, why, would you stop, why would you stop somebody who wants to go? And then all these other things come into play, about, which are sort of, Court things, you know, and societal things and legal things and all the rest of it. Yeah. But I think I think um, the ability to really hear somebody um, profoundly um, would make these decisions a lot more easy because I, I don't think there's there is an automatic listening to somebody who, who simply wants who has had enough. Mm. I think you're right. Mm. I, mean, I think you're right. Absolutely. Um, I mean, because I so agree with you, I'm going to start you trying to disagree with people, I don't quite believe it to myself. Um, I think you're absolutely right, but we also have to be careful to make sure that we are really hearing yes. what they're saying. Yeah, um, because there are, you know, and I think this is, this is sort of a good point in the legalisation debate, which is that, yes, we want to respect people's wishes, absolutely, and, you know, I'm the same as you, my own respect for people triggers an almost automatic assent in me to whatever it is that they <laughs> want. Um, but sometimes people don't really want what they say they want. No. And uh, we do that kind of resistance at that point. No. Um, because you'll be better in five days or whatever it is. Um, so I think there has to be some calibration to, to but I'm, But in terms of uh, medical profession, I think you're really onto something there. Um, and I've often wondered why it is that so many in the medical profession now so opposed um, to uh, legalisation of the system. Yeah. 
I don't know. I sort of think it might be, because they're doing it all the time. I mean, there's always, you know, ending people's lives to excessive pain relief is, is going on all the time, every day, thank goodness, you know, for most of our um, elderly relatives who, who've, who've already died, I expect we, we all experience that. Um, uh, uh, death through pain relief, essentially. Um, and I sort of wonder whether it isn't fear of an infringement of their own professional autonomy. Yeah. Um, because if assisted dying is regulated, um, then maybe some of the discretion goes out of the, of the job of the doctor in that case, and maybe therefore it is something to fear. I mean, no one wants a malpractice slapped on them for doing something they've done for decades, because suddenly it's regulated, um, and you can't... Uh, so, I mean, there may be that kind of legitimate fear. Um, but, you know, the countries that have, have managed to be more civilised about this issue in their, in their legal frameworks, by and large, have, have managed to do it with the medical establishment on board, so I don't think it's beyond this. It, it, I mean, I've had a personal experience of um, living with someone who did not be here. And, uh, I can't say she didn't want to be here as a permanent state of mind, but I can say that in an attempt to not to be here, um, quite vigorous attempts, and often it ended up with people saying, the medical profession saying, it was a cry for help. Mm. It wasn't, she didn't really, it didn't really mean this. And you know, and you fling people in hospital and get stomach pumped and all the rest of it, mm. and then they're back in the same situation again. And I find that a very difficult thing to get my mind around. Whether it's somebody actually has taken a decision, yeah. or if somebody is trying out yeah. the possible consequences of a decision, yeah. or what, yeah. Yeah. it's a very difficult yeah. area. It is. I mean, you can't almost discuss. I mean, I have discussed it of necessity in broad principle terms, but you can't really discuss this in broad principle mm -hmm. terms because it's a million different human situations. You just that's what it is. I mean, it's the that's how it and that's what makes it Yeah, I mean, that's what that's what always coming to my mind as well. Uh, while we talk about autonomy and about being democratic and about being decision makers of our own lives, but then we go back to, um, to suicide being legal for people who are terminally ill. But when you talk about being, um, you know, autonomous, that, that can apply to anyone. I mean, a 25-year-old or a 16, okay, 16-year-old a child, a 25-year-old or a 30-year-old can just get up and say, I'm an autonomous person, you know, and I make my own decisions and I'm of sound mind, I'm gonna kill myself. So there, there, need, there need to be some sort of safeguards or some sort of mm. a framework that mm. can kind of regulate this. Mm. So is, it, is this about age or is this about being in pain or is this about being terminally ill? Exactly, I mean, that's Where the does, yeah. And, I mean, the frameworks for medical assistance that exist where they exist in other countries draw the line at different points. Mm -hmm. um, some places do draw the line at different points um, and apply some sort of, you know, uh, medically certified timescale um, to it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of morphine induced absolutely. departures. Yeah, 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 yeah there are. Some countries don't. I mean, uh, the Netherlands has always provided and Belgium too have always, always provided the most extreme um, uh, examples because they sort of have said, well, what you said before you said there should be a framework of protections, so they've sort of said, well, autonomy is autonomy is autonomy. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, within certain yeah. uh, restrictions, very narrowly, um, will allow these things. But they come from a very different medical tradition. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the Netherlands, for example, um, the, the, the law, their law on euthanasia comes out of a medical tradition where doctors have traditionally been given much more choice over what they do to patients in terms mm -hmm. of prolonging yeah. or not prolonging life, um, especially in the area of uh, children born with serious deformities. Mm -hmm. Now that used to happen in this country too, there's plenty of stories from my grandmother's generation of babies that were you know, mm -hmm. born and then taken away, and oh dear, it was still born, and it wasn't still born, mm -hmm. but there was you know, sufficient uh, problems with them for, for, for midwives and whoever to have made what they would have seen as their professional choice or duty, they would have seen as a duty to say that this pain is not going to not going to survive um, because we're not going to let it survive. Now that's okay, that's bad. But uh, 
um, in the Netherlands, it's much more strong tradition. So their assisted dying, their euthanasia legal framework today grows out of a very different, different medical tradition. In Britain and in the United States, where we have a, a greater philosophical and social tradition of individualism, mm -hmm. the argument is always about autonomy and individual choice. Um, and, um, you know, in other countries it's often about medical knowledge and uh, you know, um, medical professionalism and so on. But it, it's always framed for, for us uh, in the UK, I've noticed it's always framed in terms of individual choice. Individual choices, I mean, this can also be applied to drug use, drug like, yeah. use. And there's so many other social issues that individual choices kind of yeah. you know, exasperate, and that's why they have to be regulated. So, yeah. Yeah. is it is um a organisation like Dignity and Dying? Is that the kind of framework <coughs> that's there for people who? So Tony Nicholson, Paul Lamb, you said Nicholson. Nicholson yeah. Sorry. Yeah had friends and family who are and were willing and able to be their advocate, to talk them through them, to help them and to act on their behalf. And maybe, say like in the 1930s, doctors would be doing it anyway. They still are. But maybe in the 1930s, would someone have had the same doctor all their life? Yes, I see what you mean. And they they were maybe closer to their families and they didn't move away from where they grew up. So there was that sense, like, yeah, I've known this person since they were born, I understand. They've kind of seen it follow through, and everyone would be able to make that decision as a team. Whereas now people live more individual lives, and maybe that's part of the fear, because it's harder to decide, because it would be like a bureaucratic thing rather yes. than an emotional yes. response. Well, I don't know if you, I mean, certainly, okay. I don't know if your assumption is true about how life has changed in the last 80 years, but yeah. I mean, if it were to be true. Um, well, not for everyone, but I mean, like, so Tony and Paul had advocates yeah. for them, but what, how do we help people who don't have anyone? How do we protect them from unforeseen consequences, or how do we help them to end their lives? Both. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, bureaucracy, of course, can be incredibly dehumanising, um, and it is uh, something with which, you know, to feel that way have difficulties. Um, however, it's just, I think it's just a necessity in a complicated society. Um, and so there would, there would have to be, you know, an administrative framework, um, as there is for other aspects of, of life that, that, that are regulated, medical life that are regulated. Um, I mean, you could in principle, it's true, you could in principle just say, right, from, from now on, we will about it, you could just state it. Um, from now on, we think it is a legitimate medical procedure um, to bring an end to, to life in, in, you know, having discussed it with the patient. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not going to bother regulating it, we're just going to accept this fact is. Like Canada, Canada has no abortion law, right? Because it's just a medical procedure. Yeah. The, you know, you can do, yeah. you know, and there's no law about it. Like yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, you could do the same sort of thing with this. You could say, we just now accept, you know, um, we repeal uh, the parts of the law that make assisted suicide a crime, which is rather similar to the abortion law. Um, we, so we, 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 we repeal the criminal offences, um, introduce some additional criminal offence to pick up things that really are nasty, like those websites that encourage them to kill themselves or whatever, because that's the same criminal offence. Um, but we, we just say, you know, something, or we can amend the law just to say, it's a technical draft in the law, but yeah. you know, we just repeal the, the criminal bit and then leave, leave the field open. Yeah. Say this is now something that we're going to accept happens. And if you sit down with your doctor or you've discussed it before or you've left an advanced directive or whatever, and this is a legitimate medical procedure, short of malpractice going on, um, which is always a possibility with any uh, medical procedure, then we're just going to leave leave it to you and your doctor. Um, and, you know, the members of your family that you might discuss anything like this, like the decision to have chemotherapy or right. radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, we could do that. I mean, that, that might be, uh, you know, that might be acceptable. That's we might decide that the social cost would be 
you know, that we would say a few people that came out dying when they shouldn't. Um, but the gain of, of, you know, a lot of people having increased access to that autonomy would be greater. We might just leave it at that. These guys, these guys are going to come up with effective advocacy taking one position or another. I see. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. So you could not represent the position you've taken, yeah. but simply exercise your capacity as an advocate. So yeah. that's quite interesting, you know, in a, in a lot of the work that designers do, you find yourself doing things that you don't personally feel empathy with, but it's your job and you're paid. That's a moral discussion to make. <laughs> yeah. and, then you, and then you decide whether you do or whether you don't. Yeah. So it's been really interesting listening to you because I think um, I just have, <laughs> it's all, maybe this is about me really, but I, I find um, the side of life which is finger wagging at people and trying to use the law as a finger wagger, very unsympathetic. So, you know, that, 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 that's where I yeah. kind of stand with this. I, I would be very clear what my advocacy would be, but I also completely respect someone coming to the other point of view mm -hmm. for a whole variety of reasons to bring them there. Mm -hmm. But that's what you guys have got to decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really like the idea you mentioned, like, this is individuals, right? Like, to human you know, people and their life. But our project is also about like having people to choose, yes. about like choosing this is your decision to make, whether to live or not. But there is like always I'm confusing of what is the boundary. Like what you just mentioned, maybe there is opportunity to you know, give some professional uh, medical advice or help to assist suicide if you want to do this. But where is the boundary, you know, between assisting suicide or murder? You know, if this is individual rights, then that's the decision you have to make and be circulated by yourself. If other people's involved, how? You know, in yeah. that, you know, it's very blurry the boundary, like how we should look at it. It is very blurry, um, and it's complicated by the fact that very often you come to these cases when they've already happened. Um, and you have to, and you have to say. I mean, if, if someone goes to court these days um, because they're accused of murder, let's say, um, and they actually it was an assisted suicide in the sense that someone wanted to die, um, then you know all you've got is their word for it, really. Um, and perhaps you know the balance of probabilities and, 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 and reasonable doubt and, and so on, depending on how this case is presenting itself. And I think that actually is one of the stronger arguments for not just having a total liberalisation, yeah. the protection of people who are still here afterwards. Um, so I think that if that's a good argument for having a regulatory framework rather than just allowing it to happen amongst you know, physicians and patients. And the author Terry Pratchett, who um, is one of our members and has joined our campaign on this, but has also made some documentaries and, and joined Dignity of Dying as well, um, he suggested we have this tradition in English in the English legal system of something called a coroner's court, um, which is when a, a death has occurred before there's any sort of other legal things that happen. That, that, that used to be always a coroner court hearing, which would just look very quickly into um, you know the circumstances of it, what had probably happened, had this person just died by misadventure, was it murder, was it whatever. Um, and he suggested that following in that English legal tradition, you could have a sort of pre coroner's court. Yes. So every time someone did want to take advantage of you know, physician assisted suicide, they could just have a hearing very quickly, advocates both ways. Is this something? Is it wrong? Yes, you can. We see that if this assisted death occurs, it's genuine assisted death and not any sort of murder. Um, you know, that certified. <laughs> that's certified. Uh, that's, that's that. And that's a possibility. But, uh, I mean, if you're not just going to have a totally liberal situation where you say if this happens, it happens as part of medicine, and then you do have to have some sort of regulation framework. And I think it's just the question is just what sort of framework do you have? I think it has to be a framework that uh, kicks in before the assisted death, not afterwards, because it puts people in a difficult position otherwise. And it 
leaves them vulnerable um, to prosecution or to criminal charges. Yeah. And also, like, uh, you know, we, we talk about individual addicts all the time, but actually, the truth is, everybody has some sort of connections with so many people, like your loved one, your friends, and even like your doctor. So, as we uh, consider us as a people with relationship with the people about to die, like how much we can do to respect or to help them, how, where, like how far we can go for them. For example, because I'm uh, coming from China, and my brother is a doctor. And there's a severe situation like in China. The families and friends tend to blame the doctor while they fail to save their loved ones. And there's a, some doctors even get killed by this because people just tend to get angry. Like there's a death happened, somebody's not really responsible for that. And then when doctor or medical people in that field carry that responsibility to do the helping job, which they think they're helping. But actually they're playing like the role of God because they're not only saving people, at the same time they decide to go away to death. So if that's a duty they have to care, carry, like we talk about in visuality, is he's, he's just a doctor, he educated that like, like when we try to break the to 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 sell, maybe not to sell the idea that uh, it's your own right. It's breaking the common sense, which I think I believe all of us haven't been educated about how to face this situation, how to react. Yeah. A lot of people like when we react wrong and cause tragedy. So, yeah. what should we know if we don't break that common sense and do that new one? Yes, yeah. so, I think that's right. I mean, that's. That's not a question. That's a reflection, and I think it's a very, uh, very wise one. I mean, all, all human beings, you know, are individuals, but we're also embedded in the relationships that we have with other people. I mean, we're all, you know, none of us is independent um, in, in in that total sense. And so much of life, and so much of social ethics, um, is about, you know, negotiating those boundaries between our, our individualism and our relationships. With that's that's true. Uh, it's funny the analogy of because words like murder and killing and suicide and these words aren't really very helpful because they're trying to corral feelings which are much more nebulous and much mm -hmm. more variegated. Drive them into a pen. You know, like, oh, okay, we're going to kill you. Isn't really what's going on. Letting someone go is a different matter altogether. Uh, apart from which, no one has the slightest idea of what happens when we die. Yes, well. <laughs> Actually, in, sorry, in Japan, so I feel it's hard to share the sense to end your life or finish your life is also one of the right for yourself. Because, you know, once if in Japan someone on suicide, the always tend to find a reason why he is on suicide. The final reason in the outside is not in himself. But still, someone has something responsibility. Perhaps parents, teacher, doctor, or someone else. Someone to blame. Yeah. So that's why I yeah. think that they have is the right to finish his own. Uh, right, is not existing is himself, maybe. Yeah, I think also, I can see, I can see, I can see, I think we've got to think about death in a different way as well, though. Yeah. I think that's the point. Why should, when death occurs, be something that, that triggers a search for responsibility, a search for blame, a search for, you know, all these other uh, things? I mean, I think, and this is, this is a much deeper question, but I think that we are still, you know, Ill at ease with death. I mean, we're rejecting death all the time, and quite and quite rightly. I mean, you know, we, we, we should, otherwise we wouldn't want to keep living every day. You know, we do want to keep living every day, um, most of us. Um, and life is, you know, better than the alternative for most of us and for most of us. Um, but I think we nonetheless have to be at peace with death and to understand that it is, 
you know, a natural part of our existence and not to fear it. I mean, so many ills in the in six millennia of human culture have come from the fear of death, religion for a start, <laughs> which is where it comes from, really. Um, fear of death or fear of powerlessness. Um, but, I mean, it, it remains one of the most damaging, implicit facts about our, our worldviews, the fear of death. It really does. But, yeah, that's also why I really like something you said that uh, is quite different to what we heard before, is that uh, uh, in relation to uh, pro, let's say you're pro-assisted suicide, you can be, if you're pro, you can be a compassionate person. And for me, the use of this language, like compassion and respect, is kind of almost used for people that are against assisted suicide because there's a lot of like religion belief behind it. And I think you could try talking about assisted suicide with words like this, compassion and respect, and not, you know, the, the other words that you usually hear, like killing and death and murder. Well, it's no surprise, I mean, that the people the main bodies that are against assisted dying always use the word kill. Yeah. I mean, care not killing, which is the name of the organisation that lobbies against uh, assisted dying. Um, and that's what the law, the law uses language yeah. to corral. We were talking before we came in about committing suicide. Yes, exactly. Suicide used to be a crime in England um, before the 1950s, when it was, so people were trying to kill themselves, um, and then they'd be arrested <laughs> for what they'd done if they didn't. We weren't successful. Um, and we still use that language of committing suicide. You commit a crime. You, know, you commit a theft. You commit a burglary. You don't commit suicide. Um, and this is all a legacy, both of um, you know the feeling actually that the state owns your body. I mean, this is where a lot of the